Welcome. Um, my name is Dahlia Mady and I'm the Chief Executive of Youth Aliyah Child Rescue. Um, at the moment I'm sitting in my living room alone talking to a laptop so uh, it is pure faith that you can actually hear me and that there are people watching. So welcome, uh, thank you very very much for choosing to spend part of your evening here with us. Um, this is one of a series of virtual events that we've been holding to support Youth Aliyah Child Rescue. Um, tonight we've got a really exciting, I've been really looking forward to this one uh, since it was announced. Um, I want to thank the committee. We have a fundraising committee who's been putting all these events together. Um, and for tonight's event, I especially want to thank uh, Morris and Marsha Selwyn for introducing us to the Benjamins. Um, you'll soon find out why we're as grateful as we are. Um, so um, before we get started, I want to tell you a little bit about um, the charity that you are all supporting tonight with your, um, with your ticket purchases. Youth Alia Child Rescue has been going since 1933. Um, it started in response to children coming to, at the time, uh, mandated Palestine, uh, subsequently the State of Israel, uh, to escape from the uh, uprising of the Nazi party in Germany. Um, children were arriving without families, they were being sent there by their families to uh, save their lives, and um, their families were not able to follow and join them afterwards because of the Holocaust. And so the children were housed in youth villages. So uh, based on the kibbutz model, the children would live there, they'd go to school there, they'd work and train to do jobs when they were older. Um, and those youth villages still exist today. Uh, we've been supporting them since we, we were there at the beginning. We've been supporting them ever since. Uh, today, those youth villages have evolved to be a home uh, and a place for healing and growth and learning and community and support uh, for both immigrant children. Children have come to our youth villages from all over the world, uh, from Ethiopia, the former Soviet Union most recently, but also India and Iraq and Iran, France. Um, Brazil, Argentina, um, and, um, and, and the children there uh, are supported in a way that allows them to heal from the traumatic beginnings that brought them into our care and, and not just lets them survive, but it really allows them to become leaders, leaders in their own communities, leaders um, for the nation, for all of Israel, uh, and, and even leaders internationally. Uh, I said that some of the children, 50% are immigrants, the other 50% are Israeli born. Some of them second or third generation immigrants, but they're born in Israel. And these are children who are coming from um, very, very dysfunctional families. They're coming from extreme poverty, situations of abuse and of uh, severe neglect, uh, substance abuse, violence in the home, um, uh, involvement in crime, uh, and um, really the villages, the youth villages are their last hope. Uh, and we see the potential in every child and we make sure that that child sees the potential in themselves. Um, pertinent to tonight, I, I must add that uh, at least 30% uh, of the children that we care for are under the care of a therapist or a psychiatrist. So they are also coming to us with mental health um, conditions um, and they get full support and care uh, around those as well. Um, so your donations tonight are going to help to provide all of the above and beyond that uh, these kids deserve, um, that allow them to, um, to do the most incredible things as adults and uh, to build a better Israel for everyone. Uh, so that is what we're supporting tonight. So thank you uh, for that. Before I introduce you to uh, our guest speakers, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first of all, we are recording. We're recording tonight's event um, so that, so that it can be shared uh, afterwards and especially so that we can share it with, um, with our friends in Israel uh, in the hope that um, 
the messages can reach the children there as well. Uh, know that uh, while we're speaking, we cannot see you. You can see us, but we cannot see you. So if you're in pajamas, it's absolutely fine. Um, during the course of the of the presentation you'll see a question and answer icon at the bottom of your screen you can uh type in questions at any time you like during the course of the evening we will address the questions at the end um, and you have some choices when you ask a question um, if you're doing a written question um, you can choose to click a box saying anonymous so it can be an anonymous question if you'd like. If you don't click that box uh, and it has your name, then know that I will ask the question announcing your name um, unless you ask me not to. The other option that you have, some of the questions we're happy to do on camera. What we'll need to do, if you, if you want to do that, please write at the end of your question uh, on camera so that we know to, uh, to do that. Uh, if you choose to do that, what will happen is we will um, change your status from attendee to panelist. So there'll be a little pause where it looks like you've been kicked out of the webinar. Sit tight, you'll then come on screen, uh, you'll unmute yourself and you'll be able to ask your questions to Johnny and Michael. And then once you're done, once they're done answering your question, you'll then revert back to being an attendee. So let us know if you want to do that on camera, that's absolutely fine. Um, and just one, uh, one thing I need to point out to you, uh, Johnny and Michael are happy to answer any questions. I've been told nothing is off, is, uh, off limits, uh, but they do want you to know that uh, beyond answering questions in the context of this webinar, they're not able to engage in individual situations uh, moving forward. They're happy to signpost. Uh, we will be sending out links uh, to uh, mental health um, organizations that you can go to for help if you have uh, a family member or if you yourself need some support around that. But uh, please don't ask Michael or Johnny to uh, engage beyond answering questions tonight. So that's all the housekeeping. So I am very excited to introduce our guest speakers tonight. Um, Johnny is a mental health campaigner. He's also a public speaker, a TV producer and presenter, the cr a creator of programs for secondary school children. He's a published author, he's the founder of a charity, and he's an MBE. And how does a, a young uh, North, Northwest London Jewish boy uh, come to achieve such an enormous amount? Um, his story, his journey to this point is a story that is really best told by him. And so that is what he's going to be doing for us tonight. Uh, when I asked Michael, Johnny's father, uh, how, how he would like to be introduced, uh, he said, I'm just happy to be Johnny's father. So um, with no further ado, I am delighted to welcome to our screens, uh, Johnny and Michael Benjamin. Hello. Hi. Hi, Hi Johnny. Hi. And Michael's going to be. That's there's somewhere. Dad, are you are you there? <laughs> he will be. He he'll, he'll he's there somewhere. Here he comes. There he is. You, and Michael, you need that. to unmute yourself. <laughs> I'm here. There you go. Okay. But luckily, um, your names are written in the corner of your boxes, so I don't need to tell people which one of you is dad and which one is son. That's good. <laughs> That's good. Okay. All right. Well, I will. Um, I will mute myself and hand over to you guys to to get started. And uh, I will unmute when it's time for questions and answers. So, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dahlia. Uh, yeah, Dad and myself are uh, very very happy to be here tonight uh, to speak to everyone. Uh, we're looking forward to um, giving our talk and then taking some some questions. Uh, as you heard, please ask us anything, um, anything you, you want to know, any thoughts you have, please do, please do share them. Um, I'm very excited actually, because uh, I've just got uh, my Hanukkah bush. Um, I just picked this up. Uh, so yeah, I'm just showing it off very, very proudly. Um, and I am also actually in my, in my pajamas. So, um, you know, 
if you're in your pajamas too, don't feel bad because uh, I am. I am as well. Um, but right, I've, I've actually got a presentation to share with with everyone. So I'm going to just uh, share my screen. If you bear with me, um, here we go. So um, hopefully you can all see that. Um, yeah, great, thank you. So yeah, a dad and myself are going to share our, our story with you. Um, we we talk very openly about about mental health, um, and for some people this might be triggering. And if it is triggering, then you know, please do take some time away. Please do don't feel you have to stay. You know, take some time away, come back. Um, but we don't want anyone to have to feel um, triggered at all. But I'm going to take you back to the the very beginning of uh, of the story, and my story starts here. So um, I was born uh, in January 1987 in a, in a place called Watford. And um, I had a really happy childhood. I've got really happy memories uh, of childhood. So this is me and dad on our first family holiday. Um, I think it was to, to Spain. That's right, dad. Um, yeah, I think it was, yeah. Um, so yeah, really happy memories of um, of growing up, I grew up. Uh, I grew up with mum, dad, um, older brother as well, uh, and this is uh, me and him at his bar mitzvah. Um, and it was it was after this point that things started to change a bit for me. So I, I stopped sleeping properly. Um, I would only sleep with with mum and dad. I wouldn't sleep on my own. Um, I became. I became quite anxious. Uh, I became withdrawn. Um, I became quite violent as well. And um, obviously, mum and dad didn't understand what was what was going on, so they took me to the doctors. Um, and eventually, I was referred on to a, a child psychologist. And this is the letter to the psychologist. I saw this psychologist for a while. Um, I don't remember much of our our sessions together, to be honest. Um, but mental health was something that wasn't really, well, it, it wasn't talked about at all back then. Um, it was, yeah, it was kind of the elephant in the room, to be honest. Um, anyway, I started school, I went through school and um, I went through my first school and I went on to my, my second school, my high school. Um, some of you might recognize the, uh, the blazer and the tie. Uh, so I went to, I went to JFS, um, and, um, to be honest, I found it very overwhelming. Um, I mean, it's such a massive school as I'm sure many of you know, and, uh, I found it hard to fit in at first. Um, yeah, I, I found it difficult to kind of find my, find my place in the school. Um, nevertheless, I, I, I eventually found my place. I, I, made friends, uh, this is me at my bar mitzvah, uh, very happy memories. But things for me started to really change in my mid-teens. So when I was around the age of sort of 15, 16, when I was around that age, um, I started to get really bad acne. Um, and the acne got, got worse and worse, and eventually they put me on this medication which is called um, Roaccutane. So Roaccutane is a, is a very strong medication for acne and it's been linked to depression in, in young people. Um, I didn't know what depression was. Um, I didn't understand it. But when I was in my mid-teens after taking this medication, um, oh, this is me with dad, at, sorry, my, my mitzvah. Um, yeah, when I was in my mid-teens after taking this, this medication, um, I started to get really low moods. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't understand what was happening. I just felt so low so much of the time um it didn't make sense because you know i was doing really well in in school and uh i had i had friends and you know i come from a really good family so in, in my head i didn't i just didn't understand why i was feeling so low so much of the time um i didn't tell anyone what was what was going on because uh, i was embarrassed and i was ashamed um and I didn't have the language to, to talk about it, really. So I kept everything to myself. Um, 
but things got harder actually um so this is me when i was 17 and um when i was 17 um well i started to hear what i thought was a voice in my head and this voice started to tell me to do things so i'd have to i'd have to um say things at certain points or i'd have to touch things in certain ways um and the voice would say to me if you don't do this then i'm going to punish you or i'm going to punish someone that you love and it made life really really difficult um and I, I i just i didn't know what to do i really didn't know what to do when i was 17 i went to my doctor um in secret because i didn't want my parents to to know you know on the outside everything looked so good um in my exams i'd done really well uh i was i was going off to university i just i didn't want anyone to 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 know what was really going on uh internally but i went to my doctor and, and my doctor was was really good i have to say and he referred me on to um to what we call it's called cams so cams is the, the child and adolescent mental health service so the mental health service for young people in 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 this country um I saw I saw um, someone at CAMS. Um, unfortunately, there was a long waiting list after my assessment. This is my assessment. I waited months and months after this, and um, and I gave up waiting. I just said to myself, I've just got to get on with this. Um, and I said to myself, I'm going off to university, and that will that will solve everything. I thought that I could. Um, I thought I'd be able to start university and and have a have a fresh fresh start. Um, Everyone kept saying to me, you know, university is the best years of your life. So I thought, yeah, it's all going to get better as soon as I go off to university. Um, so I went to Manchester uh, to study. And these are all my housemates at university. Um, everything in my head came with me to university. I didn't leave any of it behind, unfortunately. Um, but once again, no one talked about about mental health when, when I was at university, just like school, no one mentioned it at all. And I thought I was the only person there that was struggling. Everyone else seemed so happy and they were always going out and, you know, enjoying themselves. And I really thought I was the only person that was, that was struggling. So again, I, I, I tried to keep everything to myself. Um, but at university, things got more difficult um i started to um i started to self harm i started to to misuse alcohol and i just started to isolate myself away really from people i really thought that i was going insane i really thought i was going mad um and i just i didn't want anyone to to find out what was what was going on um but eventually in my in my third year of university so this is me in um, end of 2007. Uh, at this point, I became really unwell. Um, so I actually became psychotic, which means that um, I lost control over what I was saying and doing. Uh, I felt like I was being possessed. And um, I ended up uh, going onto the streets uh, near my student house in Manchester. And I was uh, screaming and shouting and um, I couldn't control what was what was coming out my mouth. Um, it was really it was horrible. It was a horrible experience, and I knew at that point that you know I really needed help. Um, and eventually, I, I got help. Uh, I was uh, admitted to a, a psychiatric hospital, um, and when I was admitted, I was given a, a diagnosis of of something called schizoaffective disorder. So schizoaffective disorder is, is a combination of um, schizophrenia and bipolar. And that was a, a big shock. I mean, I knew that I wasn't, I wasn't well, but I did, I did not expect that diagnosis. Um, and it, obviously it was a massive shock for my family and my, my, my friends. Um, it, was a really, it was a really tough time. And unfortunately I got worse in, in the hospital. Um, uh, I stayed in the hospital for a month uh, before I gave up. I, I, there, there didn't seem any uh, future really. Um, I just saw myself as being unwell for for you know, 
for the rest of my time. And um, I felt like I was a burden on, on my family, particularly my parents. So a month into my stay, um, I decided to run away from the hospital. Uh, I made a plan. And um, so this was now um, January 2008. And uh, just before my, my 21st birthday, um, I ran away from the hospital. I said I needed a, a cigarette to the to the nursing staff and i uh, i ran away from the hospital and um i actually ended up on on the edge of a bridge um so fortunately for me uh there was a stranger that was walking past when i was on the edge of this bridge and um this stranger stopped to talk to me and um we had this conversation that kind of changed everything for me there was something about this stranger. He was just so kind and, um, and patient. And uh, in the hospital where, I'd, where I ran away from, um, I, I'd, I'd been on what they call uh, the, the suicide ward. Uh, and basically that means someone just sits and, and watches you 24 uh, seven, but they don't talk, they just sit and they watch and there was something different about this guy. This guy really wanted to talk and wanted me to talk. And I started to open up. Um, I felt, I felt safe and kind of connected to this guy. Um, there were, there were a couple of key things that he said to me. Um, the first key thing that he said to me was, uh, don't be embarrassed. He said, don't, you don't need to be embarrassed. And I was, I was, I can't even put into words how, uh, embarrassed and uh, ashamed I was of my my uh, mental health issues this this diagnosis that I got I was also struggling with my sexuality and that was a big problem you know coming from a Jewish Jewish community going to a Jewish school um, that was really tough um, but just for this guy to say don't be embarrassed you don't need to be embarrassed um, it was like a massive weight lifted off my shoulders when he said that but the second key thing that he said to me, and the thing that really got through to me, he just said to me very, um, very kind of casually, he said, mate, you'll be all right. And no one had said that to me before. In the hospital, the outlook for me wasn't great. But this guy just had this amazing positivity. Um, and eventually he convinced me to go for a coffee. And yeah, I wanted to go for a coffee. I had this, as I said, this connection. I felt safe with him. We didn't get the chance to go for a coffee. Um, so he, he helped me off the edge of the bridge to the, to the pavement and, and the police were, were waiting. I, I didn't see them, but the police were waiting a bit further down and the police quickly charged in and um, it got a bit messy and, and I was handcuffed and I was taken away. And, and me and the stranger, we separated at that point. And yeah, I was taken to the, to the local hospital and I was sectioned. I was, I was given um, a section two, which means that you have to stay in hospital for a certain period of time, which was, which was dif a difficult few hours uh, being sectioned. But once I'd been sectioned, I was then taken back to the hospital that I ran away from. And I felt a little bit different. There was still the same difficult stuff in my head, but um, I think I had a little bit of hope from talking to this guy and you know, him saying to me, you'll be all right, you know, you'll get better. I had this little bit of hope and this hope carried me through uh, the next few um, weeks and months and, and years, to, to be honest. I mean, my early twenties were kind of, um, a write-off really uh i didn't i didn't want to deal with it um I, I didn't want to talk about it i didn't want to take my medication um all, all of my friends they were graduating from university and they were getting jobs and they were moving forwards but i just felt stuck um and as well in my early 20s i was then diagnosed with um well, initially it was, it was IBS, um, and later it changed to, to IBD, to irritable bowel disease, which uh, is another uh, fun, fun illness to, to have. I mean, 
it's also quite a taboo. Again, it was quite a taboo. It's, it's a difficult thing to talk about. So yeah, my early 20s were difficult. But something changed in my mid-twenties. Um, in my mid-twenties, I finally started to open up about everything. Um, and my way of opening up was, was um, via YouTube. I found it really difficult to look people in the eyes and talk. Um, I mean, I saw different therapists. I just, I, 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 yeah, I really struggled to talk to them. It was easier for me to... Um, make videos on my phone and to put them on to YouTube. Um, and what was amazing was that people started messaging me from all over the world. People were saying to me, I've got schizoaffective disorder. Um, I've been depressed. Uh, I've got OCD. Um, it, it was just, yeah, it, it, this really helped me to, to realize that I, I definitely wasn't alone. Um, there was so many other, so many other people out there going through similar things, and this this is this is what helped me to talk publicly. Um, I finally started to talk to my family and my friends, started to open up, and that's when I think things really shifted. Um, you know, I didn't have to hide anything anymore. Uh, I could just be myself, and I I started to feel more human again at this point. I think, and when I felt more human again. I decided to um, launch a search to find that stranger on the bridge. Um, I wanted to find him and thank him for, for what he did. And so um, I, launched, uh, I launched a search on Breakfast TV. Um, I mean, to be honest, I didn't think that we would find him. Um, I mean, I, it, was, it, was, it was now six years. Six years have passed from that day on the bridge. And I just thought that he, he could be anywhere and, you know, yeah, I, as I just, I thought it was unlikely that he would be found, but we, we, we launched the search to raise awareness of mental illness and also suicide, in particular suicide, if I'm honest. Um, I mean, the statistics are shocking. Every 40 seconds, someone kills themselves around the world. Um, and in terms of men, one man every minute takes his own life around the world, which is just shocking, shocking. Um, so we, we did this to raise awareness of, of suicide. Um, but anyway, the campaign just took off. It went viral. I mean, we, we, none of us were expecting this. It just, yeah, it just took off. It went around the world. It was seen by 300 million people, the campaign. Um, so it really, yeah, it really touched a lot of, a lot of people, but the most, extraordinary thing was that um within a few days we actually had 38 people that had come forward saying i think it was me that helped you or i think it was my friend or i think it was my cousin or it was incredible all these people they hadn't they hadn't stopped me but they'd stopped someone else uh, on a bridge um yeah really just we just couldn't believe it all these um silent heroes we we called them you know people like like the person that helped me just stopping to talk to someone in distress and then just going on their way um extraordinary yeah really extraordinary but the most uh incredible thing was that we actually found the guy that i was looking for um the only thing was i got his name wrong um i i thought in my head his name was mike I don't know. I, yeah, his name was Mike in, in my head, but his name was actually Neil. And Neil came forward. His wife, actually, his wife saw this on Facebook, uh, this post. And um, his wife obviously told, told Neil and Neil said, oh my word, that's, that's Johnny. And so he got in touch and we were reunited. And um, yeah, uh, it was really, I mean, it's hard to put into words actually what that was like to be reunited. Um, I mean, it was really special, really, really special to be able to sit down with this guy and say thank you. And um, the most uh, amazing thing was that Neil said to me, well, you know, how can I help? How can I get involved and make a difference? And so we started to work together 
Um, and um, we, we had a documentary that came out on our, on our story, um, which, which was really well received. And this led to do, us doing lots of, lots of different things together. I think for me, the, the highlight was we, we ran the, the London Marathon in 2017 uh, for, for Heads Together. Heads Together is the, um, the Young Royals mental health charity. And, and we ran that together the whole way. And um, there was one point when we both, um, we, we ran underneath the bridge where, we, where we'd first met. And that was really, uh, it was very emotional when we both ran underneath the bridge and we looked at each other and said, you know, wow, you know, look at this journey. Um, so yeah, that was, that was, that's for me, that for me was the highlight, was, was the, London, the London Marathon. To be honest, I, I didn't think I was going to make the marathon. So I had a relapse. I became unwell again in um, two months before the marathon. I became unwell and I was, I was back in hospital. And um, to, be, to be completely frank, over the last few years, I've had a few relapses and ended up back in hospital. And actually, I, I ended up back in hospital in, in September. And I was meant to to give this talk in September, as I'm sure, well, most of you, most of you know. Um, so thank you for bearing with me. Uh, I'm in a much, much better place now, thankfully. Um, and I've learned now that I, I, I need to look after my mental health. Um, and I, I do that in different ways. Uh, so now I take medication. Um, I, I have therapy. Um, I've actually just come off the, a Zoom with my psychiatrist, literally just before coming onto here. So um, I'm very lucky with the care that I have and the support that I have. Um, I think I think something that really helps me massively as well is is mindfulness, and I like to demonstrate mindfulness in this uh, in this jar. I hope you can see this jar. So um, so this jar is full of full of glitter, and um, this glitter you know, represents my mind, our minds. It can be so full and cluttered and overwhelming at times. And it's hard to get some, some space and some clarity. But um, what mindfulness does for me is it just, it settles. Every, you can see the, the glitter is settling down in the, in, the, in the glass. And that's what mindfulness does for me. It just starts to settle everything down. When I'm, when I'm doing things like, you know, 10 minutes of deep breathing, um, I can then step out of my head and, you know, instead of getting lost in all the thoughts, I can just observe the thought. The thoughts and feelings are still there. You know, we can't, we can't turn our brains off, unfortunately. So the thoughts and feelings, they still come, but you know, I, I can observe them and they're not so overwhelming and intense. So mindfulness meditation has, has massively helped me, massively helped me, um, uh, over the last few years. Um, but I think more than anything, it's talking, talking. Uh, I know it's a bit of a cliche, but t talking is the thing that's helped me the most. And um, I'm honest now when I'm unwell, um, which has taken me a while, but um, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky. I'm incredibly lucky with, with the support that I have with, with my family. Um, and I'm able to say to my dad, you know, when I'm, when I'm not well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell him, I'm not well and he knows he knows straight away um so yeah i think i think i think talking is is the thing that's helped me the most um but it's taken me a while to get there um i'm gonna i'm gonna go back to sharing my screen now um but i think for me the thing that i'm most passionate about and focused on is is mental health in young people because you know when i was at school if I, I know that if I'd have got something in the way of mental health education, I think things might have been different for me. I think, you know, it could have been a different path. So my big focus now is, is going into schools particularly and talking to young people. I mean, so we know that three quarters of all mental health issues begin in adolescence. So it doesn't make sense why we don't do more in our, in our schools. Um, and I really want to see a curriculum which gets mental health education into the different 
subjects. I mean, if you think of different subjects like um, history, there's so many people in history that had mental health challenges. Winston Churchill, um, Abraham Lincoln, Florence Nightingale. I mean, you know, why don't we talk about that within the subject or in science? Why don't we learn about the brain? The brain is so fascinating and so complex. We, we, we never learned about the brain when I was in, in school. And, and in things like, uh, you know, English, when we study English, again, mental health is a theme that comes up so many times. If you think of Shakespeare, I mean, you know, I remember we studied Romeo and Juliet at school. And at the end of Romeo and Juliet, they both kill themselves. But we never talked about it. We just brushed over it. And we need to stop. We need to, we need to talk about it. So I've been doing work both here uh, in, in, in the UK, but also abroad. And this was a trip to India um, uh, a couple of years ago. So all of these young people, um, they have HIV and they all live together in this, in this massive orphanage. Um, because they've got HIV, you know, their, their physical health was being, it was being monitored, it was being treated. But a lot of these young people had had a lot of trauma. Um, and Dalia spoke about, you know, trauma earlier on. But in the orphanage, they didn't want to deal with the trauma. The, adult, the adults didn't want to deal with the trauma, their mental health. So we were working with the, the young people and the adults on, you know, what we call early intervention or, you know, prevention. Um, you know, we focus on mental health at the crisis point often when it gets to that really serious uh, point. But if we take it back to the, yeah, what we call the early intervention or the prevention stage, you know, it makes a massive difference. So um, that's why we set up um, a charity here in, in the UK called Beyond. So Beyond is all about getting help and support to young people early on. Um, so in, in the UK, you know, the average time between your first symptoms of a mental health issue and your diagnosis and your treatment is 10 years. It takes an average of 10 years between uh, first symptoms and treatment. That's not good enough. Um, you know, so that's why we set up Beyond, to get help and support in place um, early on. And most recently, actually, we have set up uh, the UK's first... Um, mental health festival for schools. So um, this has come about, this has come about in response to the pandemic and the lockdown and the impact that's had on, on young people, you know, being away from school for so many months, that's had a huge impact on so many school children. So we've, we've launched this, yes, yeah, the first um, mental health festival. It's taking place uh, in February, 2021. Uh, so far, we have over uh, 350 schools nationwide signed, signed up, which is great. But, you know, we're looking for more schools. So if you know of any schools that are interested, it's free. We, we just want pupils and teachers to tune in and, you know, um, start taking care of their, of their mental health. So that's really exciting. Um, and that's something to, to look forward to in 2021. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my, my screen uh, and I, I've spoken for, for I think long, long enough so I'm going to hand over to uh, dad um, and then yeah at the end I look forward to taking some some questions um, thank you very much again for, for asking us to speak okay good evening hello um, it's a pleasure to speak to you all um, I'm going to take you back uh, to Johnny when he was growing up um, and at school. Um, he was never any problem at school at all. Um, whenever we went to JFS for the open evening, it was uh, just went very smoothly. Everything was, oh, he does his homework, everything's fine, we never had any problems at all. So obviously we had no idea um, that how he was feeling. And it was only really when he was at university and when you look at the photographs, you can see the change in, in him with the photographs. We didn't really notice it so much. He was studying drama. We went up there, up to Manchester where he was studying and uh, he looked ill and he had this cough and um, it just didn't look, but we thought it was down to uh, students, hard living. Um, and also he was in a, in a play that was a really heavy play and uh, which probably didn't help either. Uh, but we thought, well, he'd be home soon. Um, and he came home Christmas break 
and literally locked himself in his room and uh, didn't come out at all for three, four days and obviously wasn't, wasn't right. Didn't want to talk, didn't want to do anything. Um, so we managed to get him to a doctor just up the road from us. And um, I don't think she, he was with her for that long. Um, and basically uh, she said he needs to go into hospital straight away. And we said, well, what's wrong? Well, he's suicidal. Well, we're going back now over 12 years ago now. And of course, we had no knowledge at all about uh, anybody with mental health or anything to do uh, with mental health. And so we, we took him to hospital. Uh, she made arrangements to go into a psychiatric hospital in, in Harrow. Uh, we got there and it was completely changed our life completely. Um, when we arrived, uh, they, they, they met us and they literally took everything away from Johnny, the wires and everything else. And all they said was he's suicidal, um, so he needs to go into a ward to be watched. And by the way, these are the visiting hours. And that was it. Um, and we, heard, we were also told, oh, by the way, you can probably come and have lunch with him. Uh, but there was no help for us at all. Um, thank goodness uh, it's, things have moved on. Uh, maybe not as much as we'd all like, but it certainly has moved on. There is help out there, um, which we'll talk about later on. But at that time, there was actually no help at all. Um, and it was just a few days <laughs> before Christmas, I mean, this time of the year. Um, so um, we, we got in the car and, and we really didn't know what to do. Um, we had no idea. Um, and then when we, we, we told a few people that Johnny was in hospital, of course, the first thing that is said is, well, has he broken his leg? Has he had an accident? And you have a guilt feeling because A, um, one is that, why didn't I know anything? Um, but you also have anger as well with, with yourself as well. And we tried to explain to Johnny's elder brother and, and he also couldn't really take it in, or certainly couldn't take it in either. And his, his reaction also was like us, it was, it was a bit of anger there. Well, why didn't, why didn't he tell me? Why, why hasn't he spoken to me about it? Um, and that was, that was it, we, 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 we just didn't know what to do. Um, and we went back to the hospital, we, we had to go back. Uh, we saw the psychiatrist and I call it clipboard. Um, uh, because basically um, you sit behind a desk um, or he sits behind a desk and there were the three of us in the room and we couldn't quite understand why he was kept on looking up behind him and when we stood up we realized that there was a clock behind and basically it was your time is up and that's it and basically it was a clipboard with ticks and okay this is it um, and there was no explanation at all um, what we could do, if we could do anything, or even what they, they found. Um, so it was it was really helpless. The one thing, and, and we, you, you'll hear it quite a lot tonight, is is talking. Um, and one of the things that happened was we then started to talk to a few people, and it was only then that uh, suddenly uh, somebody that we'd known for quite a long time said, "Oh, our son." has anxiety um, and then someone else said oh I suffer from this and someone else suffers from eating disorder um, and what it is you need to talk to people and we've all got lots of acquaintances but you know you've got a, a close circle of, of friends as such that uh, and those are the people you need to talk to because they don't make judgments um, they don't know what to say because no one knows what to say in those circumstances because like us they've never you know, except for people that had people that suffered, uh, you don't know what to say um, because it's not as if someone's had an operation or something to say, or oh, wish them better or whatever. In fact, people did say that to us. Oh, I hope he's better soon, um, because and it's 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 not their being ignorant at all. It's just that it's just no knowledge of of anything at all. Um, and we didn't really talk about it. Um, and then what happened was that uh, I was actually in London for, for a, a meeting, actually, um, a business meeting. And I got a call on my mobile, which I normally switch off, but somehow I didn't. And I was just told, Johnny's run away uh, from the hospital 
Um, he was on a bridge, but he's okay now. Um, and he's in a hospital in London. And if you go there, um, it'd be in an emergency um, ward. So I went there and basically walked in and don't forget this was a January. All he had on was a t-shirt. He had scratches on his arm and tried to talk. And again, there was no help at all from, from the hospital at all. Uh, all they said to us was, uh, oh, and he was completely by himself in, in, a, in a room. Uh, there was no one there to talk to him. And basically all we were told was, uh, if you want to help yourself, there's some sandwiches in the fridge, just help yourself. And that was it. And what it was, was it was uh, overheard an argument between the doctor where he was and the doctor, the psychiatrist in, in the uh, in the home, in, in the sorry, in the hospital, the psychiatric hospital, um, arguing um, about what they should do and what they shouldn't do, and, um, and and that was it. No one actually told us uh, what what was going to happen. Anyway, he eventually went back um, to the hospital. Um, and there was a slight change, uh, obviously, um, but uh, it was it was not that we talked about it at all um, because we didn't know what to say at all. Um, and Johnny came home and gradually started to go to to do some work and and um, and then say so this campaign started. But even after that campaign, it was uh, very difficult to to open up and and to talk about things. But we did start to talk about about things, and obviously it was very emotional. Also, when we met Neil, as well as you can imagine, um, just now nowadays it's it's like we've inherited another family, um, and we've been out to dinner with with his parents, and and so it's 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 another it is another family. And uh, a couple of years ago, um, Neil had a a daughter we went to the christening um so it's 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 a completely different it's, it's it is like a family but what actually changed was that um i think that everything's fine now but i was diagnosed uh with prostate cancer and, um when i went to the hospital they told me exactly what was going to happen and they gave me the sheets and any help you need obviously you've got macmillan you've got this one uh you can call and when i came home i managed to you know talk to johnny and his, and his brother and say look this is what the situation is this is the treatment and everything else but we thought well if I can talk about my physical health then we should be able to talk about mental health and that's when we really started to talk and basically as Johnny said it's very difficult to talk face to face so our conversation and it still happens now um, is that we we talk in the car or we talk side by side so you're actually not facing somebody and it's it's open um and as johnny says now we know yeah when he's not well and there's various reasons that bring it on obviously his um colitis that he has and also when things get on top of him he doesn't sleep and when he doesn't sleep that makes it worse um but also we know when he doesn't feel right but it also now tells us but the difference is as well is a, a couple of things as well with, with, the, with the psychiatrist um johnny sees this psychiatrist now we know uh, that she's always going to be late uh, for any appointment because she has the time uh, she spends the time uh it's not a clipboard there's no desk and it's very open conversation uh, I don't go in when, when John is there, but I, I, I'm asked to go back in afterwards. Obviously, she doesn't tell me everything that Johnny says, uh, but we have a conversation. And, and again, one of the other things was when Johnny was in hospital, uh, we actually, my, myself, bumped into, uh, into her coming out of the lift. She'd actually just been in to see Johnny. And again, it's a little bit like, you know, said, he's going to be okay. Don't worry, he'll be okay. He's in for a few days rest and it'll take time but it'll be okay and it's that hope and i think it's that that whole thing of, of giving people hope um and as i say there's a lot of help out there um one of the biggest questions we're always asked is um how you know how can we seek help and what we've also as part of, apart from the charity but what we've also done is um we were we've talked actually at um i've never been to, to so many shawls in my life um because one of the great things is the, the religion is really taking it on and a lot of the rabbis are really um, 
uh, getting to grips with it and, and helping. Uh, and in a lot of the synagogues now, they are helping um, uh, people. And I think they know that, that there is a help that was needed there. Um, but I think, you know, um, one, of the, one of the things that, that we find is, uh, is, is talking to people that they're much more open now. And young people, especially, are much more open. We spoke, we spoke not long ago, I think, at, at, at um, Boreham Wood, at the shawl at Boreham Wood, and they had, the, they had parents and young people there. And the young people were very open about how they feel. Um, and even the schools now are taking a lot more on, although it still needs to do a lot more. But really, if you need help, ask for it and also talk. The other thing, one of the other things that we've done and then hand it over again, is we were at um, one show and someone came up to me and said, you know, Jamie, who do a fantastic job, I mean, Jamie are, are, are do a fantastic job, they really do. But they said that there's a family forum um, for uh, parents that have children that are suffering. Um, and it does help. However, no men, no men ever go. It's always the, the, the women that go. So we've now started a father's forum. And it started with just a few of us going out for something to eat and, and talking. Um, but now it's grown. Um, unfortunately, like everything, we can't meet face to face anymore. So we, we have a Zoom. In fact, we've got a Zoom meeting next week. Um, and it's grown. I think we're now in 14, 15 people. Not everybody can make it all the time. And it's, it's, a, it's a way of, of people being able to relax and to talk about things without really making any judgment. Um, and afterwards, if anybody wants more information, please let Dahlia know and pass on the details to, to me. And then I can be in contact to, to give you the details of, and you're quite welcome. There's no charge, <laughs> there's nothing. Um, when, um, when we get back to meeting, um, we meet at, at, at Jamie's offices, um, someone brings in bagels and uh, we have coffee and we sit down a couple of hours and, and talk about um, how everybody's feeling. And also in, in many cases, uh, we, we can help. We can say, well, have you tried this or have you tried this or, 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 or have you contacted these people? Um, and so please let, let me know if, uh, if you want any more detail. I'm gonna hand back now to uh, Dalia to see any questions. Thank you. Thank you both so, so much for, for being so generous with, with yourselves uh, and, and uh, you know, with your experiences. Um, we do have some questions and I've jotted down a few of my own as well. Um, I'm going to remind uh, the attendees, all of our guests, if you have questions, please um, feel free to type them into the Q&A box. If it's not uh, on your screen, you just need to hover your mouse or your finger uh, on your screen and it will say Q&A. You can type in your question, you can choose to have it anonymous. And if you want to be on screen to ask your question, for your moment of fame, uh, just, just mention it in your question. Um, in the spirit of openness and sharing, uh, I'm going to um, share with you that I too am wearing my pajamas. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I am business on the top, pajamas on the bottom. Uh, and mine are uh, Ravenclaw Harry Potter pajamas. Just oh, nice. full disclosure. Thank you very much. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to uh, dive, move straight on from there and dive into some questions. Um, so uh, Deborah wants you to know, Johnny, I'm assuming Johnny, I think you're a total inspiration and I'm so glad you're now in a better place. Well, thank you. Thank you. That means a lot. Thank you. I have to say, I love how gracious you are. Every time someone says something nice and kind and, and supportive to you, you're always just so gracious about just receiving that caring and love. It's lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have a, a question that has uh, been made anonymously. Johnny, what 
was or is your experience of psychiatric hospitals in the UK? There have been concerns raised about conditions, overuse of restraint, etc. Yeah, um, I mean, to be honest, uh, I think there's been a lot of progress in mental health over the last few years, but progress in inpatient settings, I've not seen happen. Um, I've been in a few different hospitals and yeah, I've not, unfortunately not had great experiences. I mean, there was one hospital I went to, which, which made me worse. I came out worse than I went in. Um, I'm sure dad will, will agree with this actually, cause he's been into all the hospitals with me. He's seen them all. Um, I just, I feel like things could be really different in, in hospitals. They need to be different. And actually, um, a few years ago, myself and Neil were invited to um, a psychiatric hospital in, in Grimsby. And in Grimsby, um, they've got this service where the inpatient hospitals, it's very collaborative. So the patients work with the staff um, on things like designing the menus and um, putting stuff on the walls. Um, they had a... A, a garden centre within the hospital that the patients looked after and they sold to the... It was so nice to see a therapeutic environment in the hospital. A lot of the psychiatric hospitals I've been into, um, they're not... I just feel they could be so much more therapeutic. They really could. Um, so I think there's a lot of work to do um, in terms of the psychiatric hospitals, for sure. A lot of work to do. Um, I have to say, when you were talking about uh, one of your hospital stays where you were on suicide watch, um, I, prior to this role, was a nurse. And I remember, actually, when I was still training to be a nurse, this was in America, um, they had me sit in someone's room when they were on suicide watch and they, I was given clear instructions not to speak to them. And it's, it's just plain weird. Sure. It's not, it's not human, right? Like there's no, it, it feels very dehumanizing for both patient and staff. Like that's just not natural to sit <laughs> in a room and not talk to someone and watch them. Yeah. So I agree with you. Like there's a lot that we can do better. And I will say our youth villages do um, an incredible job with providing a, 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 just a, a very sort of everyday therapeutic environment where where the students do uh, engage in, in agriculture and, and nurturing animals mm -hmm. and being involved in the running of the village and, and being expected to contribute to their communities. And I think it, yeah, it, it makes a huge difference. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. One, one hospital that, we, he, he, that Johnny was in, um, it didn't seem to be anything there at all. I mean, basically there was a, a big desk there with, uh, it looked like students there really. Um, and there was nothing there during the day. Um, TV and a lounge uh, and that was it. Um, you know, we, with the charity, we know ourselves, um, there's arts and, and animals as you quite rightly say, uh, help. Um, and to keep people occupied all, all the time and just sitting and just sitting there. I mean, it, it doesn't help at all. Yeah. Um, Beth Feingold has a question. She's asking, do you feel that the best therapy for you has been being so proactive and reaching out and helping others? Yeah, uh, definitely. Well, I think the best therapy for me has been talking for, for sure. Talking. Um, yeah, for sure. But yeah, um, definitely reaching out and particularly helping young people. You know, uh, sometimes I go to schools and, you know, or, or universities and I'll give a talk and a young person will come up to me and it's the first time they've ever opened up and, you know, I'm able to be there for them and, you know, guide them as to what they, sh they, they can do next. Um, so I think, yeah, for me, and that gives me the kind of greater sense of fulfillment when, you know, can, can reach a young person, um, particularly boys. I always find that boys, um, they'll always like, usually when I give a talk, the girls will be more sort of, they'll put their hands up more and they'll come up to me at the end and then they'll go. And then the boys will be like 
standing around like mm, okay. like waiting for their like no one else to be there and then all this, mm-hmm. all this stuff comes out they've been holding on to um and uh again there needs to be more mental health support in schools i mean you know in terms of the jewish schools what's great is that jamie have now got um a well-being practitioner in in a lot of jewish schools which is great it's great um and you know i, I went back to jfs um oh i've been back to jfs a few times and it's so different now you know they are taking mental health seriously uh, well from what i see they're taking it seriously they've got things in place um so i feel like yeah i feel like things have come come a long way for sure we still got a way to go but yeah, they've come a long way um we have an anonymous question which i'm going to actually link with a question that i'd written down so the anonymous question is johnny you touched on your sexuality can you elaborate please um and my question was how has being so public about your mental health affected your dating life and relationships which i suppose leads to a last question which is which i know that other people are thinking this you are so gorgeous and lovely can we set you up with anyone? <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay. Is this yeah. a new dating agency? <laughs> Look, you know, you can't help it. You know, we're Jewish. That's what we do, right? <laughs> uh, um, um, yeah, to be honest, my, my, my dating and love life is a, is a disaster. So any help? <laughs> uh, um, I think it's hard. I think, you know, um, a lot of people just don't understand uh, you know i i saw i saw a guy once and um this was a few years ago and i remember i had a panic attack in front of him and he just laughed he said you're being ridiculous like what are you and he, this this guy was a nurse so oh. which makes me uh, <laughs> but he just was so um i don't know so kind of dismissive and um yeah just not very nice about the fact that i had a panic attack in in front of him so yeah that didn't go very far um but yeah i think um i think my well, my sexuality is something that I, I think i i to be honest i struggled more with my sexuality than i did with my mental well mental health i think they are linked for sure they're linked but i think um you know my psychiatrist had to really um kind of really pull it out of me that i was struggling with my sexuality mm-hmm. um and uh he said to me, he said, you know, you, you have to tell your parents that you're gay. You have to tell them. And I said, no, I'm not telling them. No way. Um, you know, again, as I said before, coming from a Jewish community, you know, going again, JFS is different now. But when I was at JFS, you just you didn't talk. You didn't talk about sexuality. It was such a taboo. Um, so it was it was it was tough you know coming out it was really tough and i know a lot of um young jewish uh individuals find it find it really tough coming out and i actually i, do, I work with a, a charity called keshet i do you know keshet yeah who are great they're brilliant um they are they, they do a lot of work now in, in jewish schools um but yeah i know a lot of a lot of young and you think that you know there's more acceptance today there, there and there is more acceptance right. but it's still, it's still difficult you know i think for, for a lot of young people coming out and i yeah i certainly found it really tough really tough what was your biggest fear about coming out telling telling family and friends for sure and and, and the fear of um rejection i suppose yeah. the fear of what of what they'd say um yeah for sure and and to be honest i mean everyone was really accepting you know that's the thing you build it up in your head you know everyone's gonna oh everyone's gonna reject me but yeah it, i mean to be honest i found it really difficult um coming out to my brother i i don't know why in my head I, again i built up you know this story it, it wasn't gonna go well but it was he just shrugged his shoulders and said okay <laughs> you know and yeah, yeah and that often happens you build something up in your head and it doesn't turn out Mm-hmm. you know the way you think it will mm-hmm. yeah um you have a message from Marsha who wants you to know 
<laughs> says how very proud of my nephew and all you're doing for mental health. And you've got two kisses. <laughs> He's down in, um, in Westcliff. So, um, yeah, lots of love. Hi, Marcia. Uh, Thank you for joining us. Yeah, and Uncle Melvin. Um, an anonymous person is asking, Michael, how are you? Which is a lovely question. And how Thank do you, you deal with Johnny's illness? Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. Um, how do we deal with it? Um, it's it's not easy. You know, I'm going to say it's it's the easiest thing. Um, it's not obviously it's upsetting when the uh, when, when, when he's not well. Um, uh, but I think it's it's uh, learning how that uh, he needs time uh, basically and uh, not to rush rush him. And um, uh, we deal with it because we now can talk about it. Um, be open about it um, and talk to the family and friends. Um, a friend's phone, how is he? But it's not like, oh, wishing better or whatever. It's just like telling him we're thinking of him. Um, and basically, and that's it. It's, it's uh, I'd say it's not an easy, uh, well, for a minute, say it's, it's easy, but it, it's not. But it is a situation that we, we know and is in good hands now. Uh, the psychiatrist he sees is, is very good. Um, she's, she's great. Um, and also, he has uh, a wonderful bunch of friends as well um, that uh, from JFS days and from university um and family as well so it's it's a combination and and it's uh it, it's it's uh yeah it's not easy but uh uh we just need to work with them and and know that it just takes time um without putting any pressure and he puts pressure more on himself than we do certainly yeah i have to say um yeah over the past uh well i i became on well in september when i was due to give the talk for you and um over the past few months, I've been staying in the in the room where that is now. They let me um, stay, and um, because I found I when I was really unwell in September, I I couldn't look after myself, so um, I stayed with mom and dad. Um, and yeah, very lucky, very lucky that I can uh, you know stay with them whenever I need, and um, yeah, for their support, very very lucky, very lucky. I think I think what it is, it's it's, it's support all round. It's unfortunate that so uh, we've spoken at a few places and we've had people come up and they just don't have the the support. And basically, um, you know, you need to support people and not put any pressure on anybody uh, from any side at all. Um, and just take take the time um, and then talk it over. Um, and um, and and what's why do you feel this way? Um, um, it, it, it's yeah, it's it's, a, it's it's not an easy situation, but we have um, you know some you know some good friends that uh, that help us and family um, that help us get through it. All. And I think dad dad has his own therapy, which um, you might be able to see behind him is all his uh, his golf balls. I think that's uh, one of dad's dad's kind of forms of therapy going on there and crystal palace which you can also see behind him he's got a well i wouldn't say that i wouldn't say that's therapy i think that's no. that's, that's uh Fortunate. opposite i think yeah. um no i think you need to take time out uh yourself as well um and also of course especially at the moment um you can't really see friends uh obviously arrangements over the holidays are completely different now um so you've just got to, you know, um, get on with it, um, basically. But it's it's not easy for anybody. I mean, the reports that are coming through at the moment, I mean, because of the charity that we're in, we get uh, papers through and whatever. And, I mean, they're, they're now saying at the moment, young people, it, it's it's one, one in six that young people are suffering from anxiety, lack of sleep, which... It obviously affects affects Johnny as well. Um, so there, there's a, a lot to be done out there as well. And we talk about young people, but it's also university as well. You know, it's it's been so difficult for them. Um, and the universities now, again, Jamie are uh, working with universities um, because, you know, they're certainly not having the time of their life um, and being locked up in the room. I mean, one of the problems 
is, and I know from talking to other fathers at Jamie uh, at, at our Fathers Forum, one of the problems is is having le lack of one to one um, meetings now, um, and and with therapy, it's it's all Zoom, and it, it's it's difficult. So there's a lot of work to, to be done. As I say, unfortunately, the circumstances that we're all in at the moment hasn't helped. Mental health and, um, okay, yeah, at least I can get out on the golf course and take my frustrations out and trying to find a, find a ball wherever it's gone. Um, talking of universities, somebody has asked, are there any plans to speak at universities after the pandemic? Oh, absolutely. I, I can't wait. So we did a lot of universities, not this academic year, last academic year, academic year before. We haven't gone to any universities this academic year, unfortunately, because of the pandemic. But um, yeah, as soon as the pandemic ends, we'll be going back to universities for sure. It's essential that we go to universities. Um, I mean, again, universities, uh, so many times I've been to universities and they've students have said they've the long waits there's such long waits for treatment and yeah. or in some places it was six months which is just not good enough you know so i'm concerned about universities and as dad said the impact on students is, is huge yeah but yeah we'll be going back to universities for sure great and, and also we, we we go into your into the workplace as well because uh, again it, it's 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 everywhere but one of the things was and one of the also with, with just going back to my own situation one of the things that i benefited from when i for, for my uh, prostate was early intervention and one of the things that we need to do is early intervention on mental health as well because obviously as johnny would have had that help as younger um it certainly wouldn't have been in the same situation and, and the same as young people now they need the help when they when they're young not when they get to a situation that's become very very difficult for them um and as Johnny said you know a lot of schools are now doing a lot of work um but again one of the charity one of the things we do as a charity is there's a lot of very small charities out there um that unfortunately don't have any funding lost their funding like you have uh, all charities have been affected because obviously we haven't been able to have fundraising etc um and they need funds and they do a lot of work locally um, in local schools um, that they need help. Um, and, and those are the type of um, organisations that, that we're looking uh, to work with as well. Um, I, I want to um, be mindful of everyone's time. It is 9.15. If, if um, you guys are OK continuing, we do have a lot more questions. I, I'll, I, I'll be, you know, to let the attendees know if you want to leave, it's absolutely fine. Uh, there will be no fanfare, no announcement. You can feel free to, to uh, you know, just leave at any time you want, but we'll keep going for a little bit longer. Um, so we have a few questions that are sort of tied together because they're of a theme. Um, someone's asking, I suggest a few of us would uh, like to know what signs to look for in younger people that there might be a problem. Do you have any advice on this? Um, someone ask, asked, they're all anonymous at this point, what do you think is the most important thing someone can do to support a friend struggling with their mental health? Um, and hang on. Oh, that's the same one again. And Johnny, do you have any tips or advice for parents who might suspect their children might be having mental health issues, how to spot signs and how to broach the subject? And for Michael, as a parent, do you have any advice how to deal with not feeling guilty or responsible? Okay. <laughs> Lots of question. questions. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. As far as the timing is concerned, don't worry. We, we go this is the benefit that we have now is being able to talk about it so we don't want to cut anything out and and, and obviously people um if they want help uh, or advice then fine okay so go on. you you start first okay, okay so yeah i mean signs to, to to look out for i mean you know any any changes in behavior at all um whether that be someone you know withdrawing or someone actually being um more um 
a bit more kind of engaged and a bit more maybe sort of um, hyperactive than, than usual. Um, or changes in things like diet, someone maybe is, is eating less or eating more, or sleep, changes in sleep patterns, someone's sleeping less, sleeping. I mean, yeah, any changes in behavior, it's just worth checking in and just, you know, um, just seeing if someone's all right. It could just be a phase that someone is going through, but the most important thing is to check in and just see if they're okay. Um, and I mean, I think with, with um, young people, I mean, remember young people now have access to so much on their, their phones, on their devices. So, you know, and they are talking about mental health. So don't be afraid to, to broach the subject with them because, you know, um, I, I, I see young people on social media. They are really talking about their mental health. Yeah. So, yeah, don't don't be afraid at all to, to, to talk to them about about it. I mean, my my mum, actually, my mum, her way of, of kind of communicating with me um, she would read books on, on mental health or she would, um, and she still does this, uh, cut things out of the paper or the magazine, the, the JC, you know, about mental health. And she would kind of, and that kind of works for us, for me and my mum. Mm. You know, um, that, that's how we kind of communicate through, through the different mediums. Um, or she'll say, oh, I saw this on, on TV and it was really good. And, you know, so, um, and that's the great thing. You can use things like books or um, celebrities to talk about mental health. You know, oh, did you see um, Lady Gaga said this about depression? Um, it's a really great way to engage uh, your your child, your teenager, on the subject. I think, um, but just don't don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You know, they're not afraid. Most of them aren't afraid to talk about it. So um, you shouldn't be afraid either to to, to talk about it. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, sportsmen as well, especially for the boys, you know, um, a lot of footballers, rugby players, cricketers are coming out and, and, and saying about their, their mental health. Um, I heard a talk last week um, with uh, Tony Adams, who used to play for Arsenal, and he was so open and emotional about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the thing, people are open and and and, and, and I think what really helps is life stories true life stories uh than than um, something they people have read okay they can read but if, when someone comes out you know and, and you've got someone like little mix and, and people like that coming out and, and talking about their mental health it does help and as johnny quite rightly said you know if if people want to broach the subject it's the best way to broach it by saying what do you think about this and, and whatever and it, it's actually um as I say, they, they do, and the, the media, is, is social media, has its good points as well as its bad points, um, and and it just needs help. As far as this, the question, as far as guilt is concerned, um, I, again, it's not an easy answer because you're always going to feel that guilt. Why, why didn't I know? But I, I think you've got to take it that uh, that it's not your fault. Um, it's not anybody's fault. It's one of those things. So you shouldn't feel guilty. Um, it's easy to say that, but uh, um, it's not your fault. Okay. It, it, and, and the fact that maybe you didn't know about it again, it's not your fault either. Um, it's it's just a case of being open again and, and talking things over. Um, and also for them not to feel ashamed uh, to to uh, to ask the question as well. Mm. There is there is so much stigma, isn't there, around mental illness, um, and I think the more people uh, who are the pioneers, who are the brave ones, to take that first step and say, you know, what, I'm going to I'm going to talk about mine. I'm going to just be open about it because, you know, you wouldn't hesitate to talk about your diabetes or, you know, your COVID. Uh, you know, nobody nobody is blaming someone for catching COVID. Um, so we need to strip away that stigma so that, uh, you know, I do think a lot of people do want to believe that they could be the stranger on the bridge. But I think so many of us sit here and go, but I wouldn't know what to say. What if I say the wrong thing and I make them jump, right? Um, so, so, you know, going back to the, the question that was asked, like, how, how do I help a friend, right? Mm -hmm. how, what, what, what's the language I can use? Like, how do I do it? 
Sure. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, going back to the stranger on the bridge, a lot of it was actually in the listening, not just the talking. Mm. Um, you know, uh, obviously, what Neil said was important, of course, but you know how he listened, how he was very present. Um, he gave me that space and that, yeah, that that really giving. In in this modern busy world, you know, if you think of you know, I have lots of Zoom meetings like everyone else and you, you jump on Zoom and you get straight in. You don't give people, it's just so busy. It's so on the go. I mean, I know actually that some businesses are doing, they're starting their Zoom meetings now with a five minute meditation or a 10 minute meditation, which I think is really good instead of rushing in because we just rush and we don't give each other time to really be and to talk and to open up um, in this modern fast world that we, we live in so giving people that that space um i think for me when it comes to friends i mean um you know with my friends if i look at my friends um but they had to be really patient with me really patient it, it took a long time to to open up to them um and i mean even in this the last few months when i've not been well i've shut shut away from my friends and but my friends are really good they they are they're very patient, but they're, they're persistent in a gentle way. You know, they'll drop me a WhatsApp message every few days. And they say to me, you know, you don't need to reply, but I just want you to know that I'm here, which makes a difference because in the very beginning of my illness, my friends used to, um, they'd, they'd kind of come to me and they'd say, right, Johnny, we need to talk. You need to open up. And I would just, no, I, it was too, it was intense and it was too formal. And I, I didn't, I couldn't do it. But now my friends are very um, much more relaxed and much more kind of, um, yeah, gentle. So I, I think, yeah, being, um, being persistent, but being very patient as well is, is really key. And just don't underestimate the difference that a simple message can, 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 can have really, can make all the difference. Yeah, there, there was a, one of the worst industries, believe it or not, on, on, on suicide rates is the building industry. Um, because you've got all these big macho builders and, and whatever, and they have um, a, a, uh, too many suicides in, 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 that, in that business. And it's because um, it's always like you've got to man up and you can't talk about it. But there was one, um, one builder, um, he was on TV talking about his mental illness, and he said, you know, every now and again, the foreman comes to him and he knows that he has been ill and just says, are you okay today? If you need any help, please just talk to me. And that's all it needs is just that one word. Or you just, you feel like, and I think that's the thing. People don't want to say how you're feeling um, uh, because they're a, maybe frightened of the answer, but also they don't know that you can actually ask somebody how you're feeling. If someone says, you know, I don't feel well today, it's okay. You know, it's okay to say you don't feel well. Um, and I think that makes a big difference. And that guy said that foreman coming up to him, just coming up and saying, you're okay today, makes him feel a lot better. So I think it's, it's I mean, I said right at the beginning, you know, it, it, it's a case of talking and, and that's what it is. Uh, and listening. And John is quite right. You have to listen as well. Um. I'm going to give you a couple of messages here from folks. Uh, Denise says uh, to let you know that I messaged my son, who is the deputy head of a pupil referral unit, to tell him about Now and Beyond Mental Health Wellbeing Festival. <laughs> he replied that he'd already registered his school to attend. Oh, so nice. just so you know, you're making a difference. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah that is that's lovely. Great. I mean, one of the uh, one one of the great things is we've got. I think at the moment it's one hundred and ten volunteers, therapists, art therapists, okay. psychiatrists, doctors, all giving their time free um, to hold these sessions, which is it's it's really great. And um, you know, hopefully, it's going to help young people. And then we're planning to do something in the evening for the teachers who need help, um, and also parents as well. Um, we have the uh, uh, Kate Silverstone from TV doing an interview with people on webinar. So it's, it's a whole day. So we're hoping it helps. Yeah, it will. 
Um, uh, another message is uh, from Talia. Uh, hi Talia, thank you so much Johnny and Michael for taking time to speak to us. I hugely appreciate all that you do. You're an inspiration and I'm sure you're making a difference for the next generation. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. And then uh, Anton Curtis says, it's heartwarming to see the relationship between you both and the respect you clearly have for each other. I, I absolutely concur. Uh, thank you both for a truly inspirational evening. And that's from Tina and Anton. So uh, thank, you. That thank, one. You. thank you both. Um, so uh, I have, an, again, two questions that sort of seem to mesh really nicely. Um, let's have a look. Uh, wait, I've lost it now, sorry. Uh, okay, from Pam Muscat, do you feel that some of the ultra-Orthodox rabbis give advice on mental health and risk assessment when they have no understanding or training? Dangerous practice. Um, and then we have an anonymous person who wrote, thank you very much for your honest and inspirational talk. It was really worth the wait to hear you. Hmm. Having had mental health problems in the past and coming from a traditional Orthodox Jewish family, unfortunately, there was no understanding at all. And I did not get the support I needed from my close family and friends, which did not help at all, as I felt I brought shame to the family. It still hurts now, but I have found wonderful friends who accept and support me now. But I wanted to say that I'm so pleased you had the support of a loving family around you. And who would you advise young people to turn to when they cannot talk to their family? Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, I think the Orthodox community, um, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's tough to reach them, um, to be honest. I mean, I do a lot of work with Jamie. I'm an ambassador for Jamie. And um, yeah, you know, it's, it's been several years trying to reach the Orthodox community um but it's hard isn't it when you know they they uh you know live in these really tight-knit communities bubbles and it's hard for them to let people in um but you know in some communities or in some synagogues uh my dad and my dad and myself have been to speak uh there was the synagogue in hendon that we spoke at dad that was a yeah. orthodox community a, a young yeah. orthodox community that was yeah. so welcoming and so open and that was brilliant um but there's other obviously there's other areas of the orthodox community that we really need to reach um and it's so tough when um yeah family don't understand or, or won't accept but there are lots of um so there's lots of charities i think that people are unaware of like the, the jewish helpline i didn't know about the jewish helpline until um very recently actually um, when they asked me to give a talk, but I had no idea this Jewish helpline, it, it's called the Jewish helpline, it exists and it's there. Uh, they have lots of um, people from the Orthodox community that will often phone and ask for advice and support. So uh, things like that, I mean, um, there's another project called um, the, the NOAA project, um, which is uh, for people in the Orthodox community who uh, have mental health issues. Um, again, it's, these things are often so under the radar, that's the trouble, you know. Um, but on a more, you know, on a more kind of um, out there level, um, there's lots of help and support uh, for particularly young people whose family maybe um, they can't connect to. So um, just for a few examples, um, Young Minds is, is one, um, Childline is another. Um, Something that, that we, so an organization we work with is called Shout. And Shout is brilliant. Shout is a 24 seven tech service um, that open 24 seven, 365 days a year. And just from the simple text, you can just get through to someone and they'll get back to you straight away and they're there for you. Um, so that's another really useful one um, to know about. There, as I said, there are lots of organizations out there. Um, lots of charities, charities like Mind, um there's another one called um just quickly the hub of hope the hub of hope is um it's a website and it's an app and you type in your location and it brings up your uh, nearest mental health services and groups so that's another useful one um there is a lot out there it's just knowing how to access it yeah also we we find also um because of the the way that life has changed now okay not so much lo lockdown uh but 
you know, some of the young people actually are talking to the grandparents because we're having grandparents mm -hmm. say to us all, because they seem to be able to open up to grandparents nowadays than, than, than before. Um, and also because they're picking up from school um, uh, as well. So I think it's a case of finding that the person really needs to find somebody that they can, they can talk to. And I, I think it's, it's only when you start talking uh, that you realize you, that you're not by you're not on your own um, and you just got to find somebody to that you can talk to really either a grandparent or aunt uncle friend or something like that or as Johnny said just pick up the phone you know to Jamie or to, to somebody if you need help because they're not going to shout down the phone to you they're going to they're there to help you not to uh, not, not to shout at you yeah, you know. not to shame you or yeah, in, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Howard Ross asks, why do you think that so many people seem to have mental health problems now? Do you think that the number has risen, or is it that people talk about it more now? And if it has risen, why do you think that might be? Mm, this is a debate that you know yeah. often uh, is, is often had in in recent years. We are we more people are talking about it. Absolutely, they are. But, you know, there is evidence to suggest that more and more people are struggling, particularly with things like anxiety and um, depression, actually. And I mean, um, you know, we're living, as I said before, we're living in a very different world nowadays. And, um, you know, we're living in a world that's much less connected, uh, particularly this year. But, you know, if you think of, um, you know, the way that we use technology now, you know, we can go through our day without having human connection. You know, if you go to, to the supermarket, you do yourself check out the scanning. Um, if you go to, you go on the bus now, you know, when I was a kid, you used to talk to the bus driver and you'd fiddle with your change, but now you just swipe, you don't talk to the bus driver. You know, you, I, I go to the bank now and they, they say to me, right, use the machine. And I'm like, no, I want to talk to someone. I want to, so and we know that human connection for our mental health is so important. But we're losing that. We're losing that human connection. And, and we're all looking down on our devices rather than looking into each other's eyes and having proper human connections. So for me, it's not really surprising that we're seeing more and more, particularly young people struggling with things like anxiety and depression. Um, so I think and I think technology companies maybe have a lot to answer for. Um, social media platforms have a lot to answer for. Uh, but they don't seem to be taking much responsibility, to be honest. Uh, there's a, there's a, mm, there's, there's a, I think we, yeah, there's a, there's a lot more we need to be challenging them on, to be honest. But I think it, I think it, it was there. I mean, even, I mean, just listening yesterday to somebody talking about John Lennon um, and how he suffered, but he, he hit everything and it was only through his songs that, uh, and, and when you listen to the, to the words of his songs, he was asking for help, um, but no one really looked at it that then. It's only now that uh, people are realising what he's actually saying in, in, in his songs. Um, so I think it was there, but obviously uh, with COVID, um, it certainly made matters a lot worse um, because people are anxious about jobs, about lots of different uh, lots of different things. So um, yes, it, it does, and and to say this this. Uh, I come back to it, but this lack of sleep is, you know, has a bad effect. Well, it has a bad effect on all of us, but certainly with some of the anxiety, it has, it has the, 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 uh, the effect is even worse. Yeah. Um, Joe Diamond has a question. Uh, what more can we, the general public, do to help with mental health awareness, especially within the Jewish community? Also, are you doing anything with Jewish primary schools? I know lots of young children are experiencing anxiety. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, we, we, we most definitely are doing, doing work at primary schools. Um, and actually, uh, I went into my niece's primary school, uh, Hartsmere Jewish Primary School, uh, just before the lockdown. And we did a, we did a big thing with them. Uh, for the, and it was really lovely. Um, we talked a lot about... Um, looking out for your friends, looking out for yourself. And, you know, they really got it. They really got it. It was great. Um, and in terms of what more the general public can do, um, I think, you know, again, looking out for, 
looking out for each other, looking out for people, whether that be your neighbor, you know, um, it, I mean, you know, it can really make all the difference, just a simple hello to a neighbor. Um, so there's a, a, someone that I work with um, who's in the US, who's a really prolific mental health campaigner. And unfortunately he jumped off the, he, he survived, but he jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and he's only one of, I think, three or four survivors to, to survive from that jump. But he, he, wrote, he left a, a note before he left the house that day. And he said, if just one person gives me a smile, I won't jump. And, and no one did. And he jumped. And, you know, that, all, that story has always stayed with me. You know, you just, you just never know the difference you could make just from a simple smile or hello. Because it has a ripple effect, you know. If you say hello to your neighbour and your neighbour feels uplifted, they might then give a smile to the postman. It, it, it all has a ripple effect. So, yeah, I think looking out for it, particularly again this year, after this year, you know, we need to look after each other a lot more, I think. Yeah, we do. Uh, I, I, yes, I, I will, I will make my confession because it's quite, it's sort of an interesting story that ties into that. So last night, as I was coming home from walking my dog and it was already dark out and there was a person loitering by my front door and I'm like, and I sort of confronted them because I found it unnerving that there was a stranger loitering by my front door. Uh, and uh, it turns out she was um, doing sales of uh, um, electricity tariff things. And I was like, you know, it really bothers me that you're knocking on my door and I'd really rather that you not. And I'm thinking, of course, of my son who is inside the house who does not like when strangers knock on the door. Um, and she started crying. Um, and... Uh, yeah. I felt terrible and she's like, I'm 18 years old and I'm a single mother and I'm just trying to do a job to do better so that I can become a sales manager. And I was just, I mean, I was mortified, obviously. And it, but it ended up with me and my neighbor saying look, we can't invite you in to warm up, but we can take you out to Starbucks and get uh -huh. you chocolate. So we did, and we ended up, you know, having a, you know, and it's like you said, it is those human connections, isn't it? And I did apologize for being a horrible, rude person. To her. <laughs> um, but it was a very sort of humanizing experience that, that ended up really nicely. And it was an important reminder to me, you know, mm -hmm. to like, remember that everyone out there has their struggles. Everyone out there has their story. Um, you know, and, and we need to be kinder to each other and we need to connect and be open to those connections and not shut the door on someone, you know, um, literally or, or not. Uh, yeah, so there you go. It was, it was actually a very, I don't know, it felt like quite a big moment. Yeah, it's a lovely, it's a lovely story. I mean, um, again, the, the ripple effect, the difference that made to her and then when yeah. she went home that night, the difference that would have made her, with her interactions, you know, yeah. Has, yeah. A ripple, has a ripple. Yeah, and we did, we talked about single parenting because I, you know, mm -hmm. she's a year into it and I'm like, oh, I'm 10 years into it. And so then, you know, so it was actually quite lovely. Um, but anyway, enough about me. Um, a couple more. Uh, somebody asked, um, you mentioned your brother. How does he often offer support? And it must be hard for him as well. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely, yeah. Um, he, uh, he's very different to me, uh, my, my older brother. He's, um, obviously I'm, you know, very open about, well, everything pretty much. <laughs> Whereas he's much more, um, laid back. Uh, what's that? Laid back. Yeah, he's, he is. He's very, yeah. <laughs> very laid back. And, um, we, we, growing up, we were so different. I mean, he was so into his sport, into his football, and uh, I wasn't at all. And we were very different. And we, we, I think we struggled growing up, but we're very close now. And um, he offers his support, um, usually by WhatsApp, usually by text. And for me, that's great. You know, that's just to know that he's thinking of me and he's there for me. Um, it, it makes a big difference, you know? Um, it was tough when I when I was ill the first time when, when he came to visit in the hospital we just we sat there in horrible silence it was horrible 
we just didn't know what to say to each other. Um, it was really awkward. Um, but now it's different, you know, again, um, you know, he's, I guess it, it takes time. It takes time, it, you know, build up confidence, build up some language around mental health. Um, but also his, his wife has been fantastic as well. I mean, yeah. very fortunate there. Um, she's, um, and Johnny and her are very close. Yeah. And um, so they talk a lot. And um, she actually helped, I think, uh, uh, the elder son, uh, I understand as well, and uh, she's been fantastic, and we're fortunate there as well. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, a question from an, uh, another anonymous person, uh, Johnny. You only touched on your connection with William and Kate's charity. Can you tell us more? Mm. They've been um, they've been amazing, to be honest, over the last few years. Um, we were really lucky to have a private meeting with them, um, myself and Neil, at the very beginning of their whole journey into mental health. They asked to meet myself and Neil uh, in 2016, I think it was. And um, I was just blown away by how humble, you know, I, I was very nervous. And um, yeah, they, um, they just said, call us William and Kate. <laughs> so we did. And we had a very... <laughs> very lovely chat and they really care about mental health really care about mental health um and you know the charity they set up uh which we ran the marathon for um prince william said himself you know it's it's not just a kind of uh, just a one-off thing mental health is something they are gonna you know carry on with for the rest of their lives their careers um because it's something they really care about. I think, you know, William from his mum, uh, you know, t took a lot. And, and he said that, you know, his time as an air ambulance pilot as well, he saw a number of suicides, unfortunately, and it really affected him. Um, and Kate is really passionate about um, young people's mental health, which is fantastic. Um, but yeah, they've been really supportive of us. And Prince William kindly wrote the foreword to my book, which was, Incredibly, incredibly kind and he was there to um present me with my mbe which was um which was and he was just so he's always just been so so kind um yeah so kind so very lucky to have a connection some sort of connection with them um we have a couple more comments um michael must be very proud of what johnny and he have achieved michael Absolutely. Um, you know, and uh, as, as you pointed out before, you know, so many people um, have spoken about uh, Johnny and the help that he's given. But, um, and that's uh, when, when Johnny's been ill, you, you know, he probably doesn't appreciate uh, afterwards he does. But, it, you know, um, absolutely, of course, we're all proud um, of, of what he's achieved. And as I say, with Neil, as well, um, you know, when we think about uh, the day when we took him into hospital uh, uh, to where we are now, okay, has relapses, but where we are now, it's a completely different world. And um, I mean, you know, we we've all become involved in uh, in, in working uh, with different charities on mental health. So our life has, has changed completely as well for the better. Um, but yeah, very proud. Thank you to Phil for that comment. Um, someone whose name is only coming up as Fire Tablet, and I suspect that's not their actual name, uh, says you are both very special, strong people, and I hope to meet you in person one day. So if anyone introduces themselves as Fire Tablet, you will know <laughs> <laughs> that they were here. Um, I'm going to finish with one last question of my own before I um, conclude the evening. Uh, we've talked a lot about the struggles and the difficulties of, uh, of what you uh, both and your family have been through. Are there any positives? I think, yeah, it's, it's brought us closer together as a, as a family, mm. for sure. Um, 
as I said, when, when I was first in the hospital in, you know, when I was uh, a student, um, it was so uh, just, I, I think back and I can really picture those very difficult, awkward conversations with each other, with the psychiatrist. We didn't know what to, we just, we had no hope really. We had no hope. We had no, um, there was no pathway, you know, it's, it was so different to, you know, as when, as dad said, when he was diagnosed with prostate cancer, there was a pathway, there was a, you know, a direction. But when I was diagnosed, there was nothing there. And it was, awful as a, as a family it was it was really awful but I definitely think this whole journey has brought us closer together for sure all of us all of us and it's brought us closer together with you know other members of the family family friends um people have been able to talk to us about you know their issues or their children's issues or um which is great that we can offer support um you know uh, yeah I, I definitely think it's brought us closer I don't know what you think that yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of positives. I mean, obviously, there's certain negatives, but certainly the positives outweigh the negatives. Um, I think also, for me, I, you know, I've met so many young, inspirational people as well. We've got people on our young, we've got a young board on our uh, on our charity, and they're all there for a reason. Unfortunately, they lost somebody or they've suffered themselves, and they're so inspirational. I mean, there was one girl that came on. We had a Zoom meeting. One girl came on. She was caught in the Manchester bombing, unfortunately, but she was so positive, and she wanted to help other people. Um, and I think that's also, you know, it, it, it's a positive situation that there are so many inspirational young people out there that are willing to share their experiences to help other people. And I think um, I, one email that, uh, I've got many emails, but one email that I, I, I remember is, and uh, it wasn't long after Johnny started speaking, he spoke to a very big law firm. And um, in fact, one of the senior partners came out and said the reason that I am so passionate about it is because I suffer. He said, and when I'm not in work for a week or two weeks, it's because I, I, I need, I seek help. And I think that was so inspirational, but also what happened was there was an email that came in just afterwards. And, and this young girl said that she just started work. She couldn't really talk to anybody, but after Johnny spoke, she realized she needed to seek help. She's now um, back at work and she's a lot better. So I think, that's a positive and, and you know it means that there are people that have have had help that um, makes makes the journey worthwhile that it it's amazing and it it um it speaks volumes about you as a family that you can say that the positives far outweigh the negatives um which is lovely um the theme that keeps coming up over and over is um is connection uh is that is that very simple human connection and i think that you're 100 percent right johnny that is something that that is is sort of disappearing from our lives uh this year more more than in a typical year certainly um and so we do need to find ways to just keep connecting uh with each other um so thank you for that really really important reminder um so um we got through a lot of questions we've been here for a very very long time thank you so so much um yeah. i know and i haven't that... got my pajamas i haven't got my pajamas on <laughs> we'll only believe it when we see it i don't know you may yeah. maybe you do um, <laughs> um thank you very much for being with us i want to also thank um again the the fundraising committee um but also the professional team uh, at Youth Alia Child Rescue, Nicola and Deborah, I call it the team as if there's hundreds of us, there, there are three of us. Nicola and Deborah have worked really, really hard to put these events together, so thank you. Thank you to everyone who has um, been with us this evening, who have come wanting to learn more uh, and to do better. So thank you for choosing to uh, be with us. Um, if you would like to further support at-risk children in Israel, 
please go to our website, youthalia.org.uk. You can learn more about the work that we do. Uh, you can learn how you can get involved, whether it's through donations, through volunteering your time. Uh, there, there's a whole list on there of what you can do. But one of the other ways you can stay with us is upcoming events. So I'm just going to tell you about the two that we have coming up in January. Um, January is uh, the month that contains Holocaust Memorial Day. And so in honor of that, we have two really exciting events. On the 14th of January, we are going to be joined live from Australia by Heather Morris, who is the author of the international best-selling novel, The Tattooist of Auschwitz. Um, so she's going to be uh, talking to us uh, about her newest book, which is called um, Oh, stories of hope. I may have got that wrong. I apologize to Heather. But and it's all about listening. Actually, it's all about taking the time to listen to people's stories. Um, so that ties in also really nicely with what we've spoken about. And then on the 25th of January, we're going to be joined by Iva Pearl, who is a Holocaust survivor uh, and speaker um, who will be joining us. And that event we've decided to make free of charge. Uh, the, others, the other is five pounds to attend, but this one is free of charge because we really want Iva's story to reach as many people as possible. Um, so uh, let me know if you can go to our website and book, if you are willing to share those events with your communities, your friends, your synagogues, let us know and we can send you a PDF or a JPEG uh, or links to the website or whatever you need to help to get as many people to those events as possible. That would be amazing. So um, again, Johnny and Michael, I'm going to echo what my friend Fire Tablet said. Uh, I, can't, I can't wait to meet you in person and, uh, and, and I'll even say and give you a hug that may be a bit further down the pandemic line, but certainly something to look forward to. Thank you again so, so much for being with us tonight. Thank and you. continued good health to you, Johnny. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank good night. You. Good night. Bye. Bye.